Um, so thank you comrades for uh, inviting me down to speak. As Scott said, my name is Rachel um, and I'm part of the board of the Glasgow Uni Marxist Society. We've got our lovely banner up there with the recent Gallic edition, which I'm sure you'll all enjoy. Um, so to start with, I think obviously the title of this discussion is one year on since the referendum. So we're going to start with kind of discussing that to a certain extent. But I think it's important to say that Obviously, the title of the discussion is the referendum, so we're going to talk about that. But in terms of looking um, at Scottish politics now, it is a key, it is really a key event, and we can see how the political situation um, that is playing itself now really does kind of flow uh, from the referendum. And we can really see the referendum as a turning point, or I'd say the situation in Scottish politics changed fundamentally. I think people went through a process. Um, with the referendum and we can see now how the situation that is playing out now relates back to the referendum and we can also see how there's been a shift uh, in Scotland in terms of how Scottish politics has played out but also in terms of how Scottish politics relates to the wider British situation as well and that's something uh, we'll try to discuss later on. So the referendum is just over a year ago um, it took place in the middle of September 2014 and I think it's not uh, an exaggeration to say that this was a kind of earth-shattering event. And I would say it wasn't just for Scotland. I think it was a, something that affected um, the wider British situation as well. And I think uh, the situation with Jeremy Corbyn really is reflective and kind of related to what took place uh, in Scotland the year previously. But if we look at some of the kind of stats um, around the referendum, so there was an 85% turnout um, at the referendum. This is a very important figure because, I mean, if we look at kind of the turnouts at general elections uh, in the recent period, I think they've hovered around about 60%. If I'm not uh, incorrect, I think in 2005 it actually dipped below uh, 60%. So we've had kind of a relatively low level of engagement um, with, poli with parliamentary politics uh, in Britain. And I think that relates to something that uh, Marie mentioned um, in her discussion, a kind of distrust um, of politicians and particularly with events such as the expenses scandal that obviously took place recently in Britain and other things like that I think have meant that there's been a build up of distrust um, of politicians, of MPs and not an apathy but kind of uh, people have stepped away from kind of parliamentary politics as a result of that. So this 85% turnout is the highest turnout has been any vote in Britain since the introduction of universal suffrage and as I say it's important as well that we see this 85% figure, which is the biggest since universal suffrage, took place in a period where that wasn't the norm. It took place in a period where turnout was actually lower, um, much lower than it had been um, in the past. Um, and why is that? And I think that's an important point, because that relates, I think, fundamentally to what the referendum was um, as a political earthquake. Fundamentally, it was representative of many working class people registering to vote for the first time ever, or re-registering after not having been registered uh, for a long period of time. Um, and this was reflective of the fact that in like kind of working class areas in Scotland, one example being the Wester Hales estate that's on the outskirts of Edinburgh, people actually marched to the polling stations. And many of these people would have been people that had never uh, voted before uh, in their lives. And I think that's very important. And obviously that's representative of a wider tendency and that this vote was seen to be about something that mattered. And I think that is fundamental. At the end of the day, I think for years, a lot of people have seen Labour and Tories coming closer and closer together, obviously with a new Labour, sorry, new Labour project under uh, Tony Blair. And it was seen that, well, turning out at an election to vote for two sides of the same coin maybe wasn't that appealing. Um, whereas this was seen to be something that really mattered. This was about... Uh, our country, it was about changing uh, the nation and as we kind of go further into the lead off I'll discuss what that kind of entailed um, and how that was put forward. In the end there was a 45% uh, yes vote and this is quite really quite remarkable um, I'll go into that um, a little bit later on but I would say um, when the result was announced on September the 19th and even up in, uh, up in Glasgow where I live um, the sigh of the British, the sigh of relief from the British establishment, really was audible um, as this kind of result uh, was announced. That you know this was over; it had been put to bed. 
um, and independence wasn't going to happen, although, as I'll talk later on, that's obviously not really the case. Um, if we look at this 45% yes vote, the real key factors are working class and young people. Um, in the referendum, 16 and 17-year-olds were allowed to vote for the first time, um, and over 70% of 16 and 17-year-olds voted yes. Um, in comparison, it was, it was, I think it, the figure was pretty much reversed um, for the older age group. Of like, I think it was like 65 plus. It was pretty much the opposite way around. Also, like I say, it, key were working class people and working class areas. Um, the four council areas that voted yes, that had a majority yes vote, were Glasgow, Dundee, North Lanarkshire and Western Bartonshire. And these are all traditionally working class areas, industrial areas that have suffered immensely um, since the 1980s, 1990s with Thatcherite neoliberalism, with deindustrialisation, um, moving away from the kind of skilled occupations that would have been held there uh, in the previous period towards kind of cheap service sector um, jobs. And I think it's very important as well that we see this in a particular context because you might say, well, 45% to 55%. It's not hugely close, okay, it's somewhat close, but there is still a 10% uh, margin. But there is an important uh, point to be made on this. First of all, the change that took place in a very short period of time. I mean, as Marxists, we talk about dialectics, and um, when we talk about how quantity <coughs> builds up and leads into a qualitative change, and how, you know, I think uh, it's been said before that, you know, sometimes nothing can happen in like 10 years and in a week everything can happen and I think that is very true um, of the referendum. Um, at the start of 2014, the year that the referendum took place, support for independence was around about 30%. Um, so it grew by 50% in the space of uh, nine months and I'll talk about it later on as well. It's, it's actually even more significant than that, uh, the change that took place but I'll refer to that in a few minutes. Um, another important thing um, I think that's important to mention is the kind of context of the media and the context of the bias and like the atmosphere that was kind of pervasive um, in Scotland at the time. There's been a lot of talk um, amongst the left in Scotland about Project Fear. And I don't know if you, you guys have heard of this, but it's basically about the fact that the no campaign paved the campaign. The, the whole thing that they were doing was very negative um, and it was very much based on if you vote that yes, this will happen. So it's things like if you vote yes, all the jobs will go. If you vote yes, there's a lot of fear-mongering amongst pensions in particular was a very key one. Pensions, jobs, and the economy will go down the swan. It was basically the pervasive uh, kind of image that the No campaign put forward. And this was obviously sucked up um, by the media as well, who kind of put out the No stuff constantly. And, were, you know, you had, like, these front pages, like, complete, like about the Armageddon that was going to take place. Um, if Scotland were to become independent. And this was particularly the case in the kind of fortnight leading up to the referendum because there was a poll at the beginning of September, so literally just a couple of weeks before the vote, um, which put the yes vote ahead for the first and, and only time. Um, and it put the yes on 51% of the vote. Um, and I was actually on holiday at the time, but it was even being reported in Malta. It was that big a deal. Um, so at this point, there was kind of a big reaction from the establishment, from the bourgeoisie, from the media of utter terror that this could actually happen. Um, and it was at that point that you had like kind of several leaders of big business in Britain, including like Asda, John Lewis, um, I think some of the Scottish banks, like Bank of Scotland, the RBS, basically came out and said, if there's an independence vote, we're going to relocate, you're going to lose a lot of jobs. Um, John Lewis said that their prices were going to go up and all of this was being churned and churned in the media over that couple of weeks. So I think it's very important. It shows the kind of context that this is taking place. But in some ways, what is more interesting, because I mean, we obviously expect that response from the bourgeoisie, we expect that response from the establishment to the threat of uh, the United Kingdom being broken, broken up. But more interesting, I think, is the fact that in spite of that, we still saw such a high level of a yes vote. In spite of that, we still saw such uh, defiance. And it's obviously not on the same scale, but it's an interesting comparison when we look at what happened um, in Greece with the kind of referendum that took place there in the summer, how in spite of all this kind of propaganda, uh, the Greek people still came out and voted no uh, to the package that 
they were being offered. And I think it relates to the period that we're living through. We talked about it um, in the state session as well, about how, you know, one of the key things that the bourgeois have, as well as obviously the physical bodies of the state, is ideas. And these are very important, and these are the pervasive ideas that exist in society. Things have always been this way, things will always be that way. But I think we're in a period now um, where their hold of legitimacy over ideology is breaking down, and people are starting to question them. And I think the Scottish referendum and the show of defiance is, is part of that. It's part of the fact that like, their kind of uh, hold over legitimacy, hold over ideas, um, is breaking down, um, and they're being shown to be uh, what they are. And I think that the, the reaction in Scotland relates as well to what had taken place in the previous period. It relates to the economic crisis. It relates to the fact um, that the bankers still had all these bonuses while we were expected to pay uh, through cuts in austerity. And it relates to all the kind of crises that we've had at the establishment as well, key obviously being the uh, expenses scandal, but there's been numerous others. Um, as well. So I think that's very important. Um, if we look at kind of during the referendum, and this uh, relates to kind of what I'm going to say later on in particular about the uh, election that took place just a few months ago, I think the role that Labour played in this is of utmost importance. I think there had been obviously um, dissatisfaction and frustration building up with the Labour Party anyway, um, but I think the role that they played uh, in the referendum was really a key and defining moment in why the Scottish Labour Party is in the situation that it is. So, for those of you that don't know, um, Labour went into uh, the kind of camp, they were obviously campaigning on a no side, they were against uh, Scottish independence. Um, and instead of having like their own campaign, you know, you would expect it to be based on like social <laughs> democracy, keeping uh, unity amongst people, these kind of things. Um, they formed the Better Together campaign um, along with uh, Tories um, and the Lib Dems. And fundamentally, because they did that, they were really seen to be part of the establishment, just going along uh, with the Westminster right-wing club. And this was particularly because the message that Better Together was putting out, like I said, it was wholly uh, negative, it was wholly fear-mongering, it got to the extent at certain points where they were talking about how oh, Scotland wouldn't be protected by the British Army, um, and obviously they were using things like the SNP said that they were wanting to get rid of Trident and how that would be a threat, um, and all these kind of issues were what they were really focusing on. Whereas if we look at the other side, um, if we look at the SNP, and really in particular the kind of left elements of the campaign, like the Radical Independence campaign for example, there was um, a sense of change, and I think that's very important. There was kind of slogans like Bairns not bombs, so if you don't know, Bairns is like kind of a Scottish word for children. And um, there was NHS, um, there was Cut Tried, and it was all these kind of things, all these very positive uh, messages that were really... Also, there was, uh, Rick had quite a, a good uh, slogan, which was for the millions, not the millionaires. And I think that really kind of is representative um, of what the Yes campaign was seen uh, to be about. And I think this is the context in which we have to see this Yes vote. And I think it's important that we focus on that rather than kind of, and I'll refer to this later on, talking about a kind of development of a kind of nationalistic, petty bourgeois tendency. I think it's, it's different. Um, and I think it's particularly because I said, you know, that 30% to 45% jump was a big deal. And that was like talking about it from January to September, but actually, in many ways, it, it's more concentrated than that. Um, there was televised debates between the Yes and uh, the No campaign that took place in the summer, uh, just before the vote, so like July, August. Um, and I think the one that is really important is the second debate, um, which took place in August. It took place just about a month, I think, um, before the vote. Um, and in that debate, Alex Salmond, who was at the time the leader of the SNP, so obviously like the, kind of seen as the figurehead um, of the Yes campaign, and he, all his rhetoric was about a new Scotland, a changed Scotland, and he talked a lot about, you know, we want to get away from the food banks of austerity Britain, we want a fair country, all this kind of social democracy, left reformist kind of typical things. Um, on the other hand, Alistair Darling, former Chancellor, um, Labour Party um, 
was representing the no campaign. I mean, the irony is, is that this was a kind of few, the Better Together campaign was meant to be a fusion of the Labour, Tories and Lib Dems. But because the Tories have very little representation um, in Scotland um, and the Lib Dems have a bit more, um, although now it's kind of changed, but anyway, had a bit more. But at the time, Labour was obviously by far uh, the biggest force um, in the no campaign. So despite the fact that this was meant to be a fusion of parties, really it was fundamentally a Labour thing and it was Labour um, that was seen to be at the head of it, despite the fact that they were, put, they, that they were putting forward all this right-wing stuff, which really kind of underlines how ridiculous it was that they went into this campaign when they were by far the biggest force and their force had by far the most to lose um, of all the people that were taking part. But anyway, so Darling was there and he was representative um, of the No campaign. And he had no response, really, um, to what Salmond was saying in terms of talking about a change Scotland, you know, social democracy, blah, blah, blah. I mean, obviously, what we would say is he should have been talking about, like, a change in Britain. He should have been talking about wider change. But, no, all his response was, was really about, oh, but you might not get the pound, and oh, but this, oh, but that, and all these, like, very kind of petty sort of issues. And it's after that that we really see the polls begin to change, and that's reflective um, of this one poll that put... Uh, yes in front and there was a complete panic um, in response to this and like the kind of politicians from the Better Together campaign didn't really kind of know what to do they obviously felt like they needed to salvage uh, the campaign because for a long time uh, the No campaign basically had the attitude that oh well you know they've got 30%, 35% at most we don't really need to do anything and we're going to win this without having to actually put anything forward but then this happens and it's a month to go and there's this massive, like, oh, my God, what are we going to do? And it's in that context that we see the, the infamous vow um, comes out in this period. But also, and it's quite an amusing anecdote, um, the Labour Party starts sending up, like, screeds and screeds of politicians um, to Scotland in an attempt to kind of say, oh, we do, we do care about you. Um, and, you know, we, this is our, our kind of vision for Scotland. Unfortunately, it didn't really work very well for them. Um, Ed Miliband, who was the leader of the, of the Labour Party at the time, got cornered in an, in an Edinburgh shopping centre and barraged with like kind of uh, heckles and shouts and he, he didn't really know what to do. Um, and then like there was a succession of like Labour, Scottish Labour MPs in Glasgow city centre as well. But again, you're in like, much the same situation. A guy actually walked around like with a hi-fi, with I think it was like the death march or something. And he was like chasing them around with this. And there was all, all it, it wasn't very successful to, to put it mildly. Um, and I think flowing from the referendum and flowing from what I've talked about, where we had like this big kind of polarization where the, the no campaign was seen to be representative of more of the same, the establishment, Queen and country, um, austerity, and all these things. And you had the Yes campaign, on the other hand, that was putting forward this very positive idea of change, um, fairer society, all the kind of things that people really um, have been uh, crying out for. And if we were talking about uh, one year on since the referendum, and I think flowing from the referendum, and the biggest event that's happened since then has obviously been uh, the general election uh, that took place in, in May. So if we, if we look at the statistics in themselves are very telling. I mean, you probably already know this, but I'm, I'm going to repeat it. So the SNP won 56 out of 59 seats um, in Scotland. So this is, this is obviously massive. Um, you know, they've taken nigh on um, every seat. Um, a comrade actually told me that if you measure like countries by like level of uh, representation for like one party, uh, Scotland is like second only behind China now like, in terms of party representation. Um, and there was a lot of chat from the Labour Party about how we were becoming a, a one-party a one state. So of the three that were remaining, there was one each for the Lib Dems, for the Tories uh, and for Labour. And I'm going to try and put this into context, like just how massive this is, like how kind of insane this would have seemed just a few years ago to be talking about Labour Party holding one seat um, in, in Scotland. I mean, the Scotland was the bedrock um, of the Labour Party. It provided... Um, a, a good number of its seats, despite Scotland obviously being quite a small part of uh, Britain as a whole. So if we look at the, um, the previous uh, elections, so the results from 2010, the SNP had previously held six seats and Labour had held 41 seats. So we can see, like, Labour have lost 40 seats here um, and the SNP have gained 50. 
And it's quite interesting in the context of a general election because by this point, by 2010 even, the SNP had already like stepped up the representation in the Scottish Parliament at Holyrood by quite a, quite a long way. They were the biggest party. It's got the Labour had fallen behind them. But in a general election context, um, a lot of people said, oh, well, we still want to vote Labour. We still want to vote Labour, you know, to kind of keep out the Tories. And also, like, I think Labour was still seen as a more serious party than the SNP in a sense. But we see how things within five years have just completely flipped. And I would say that this is really more concentrated as well from, like, the kind of year um, that's taken place since the referendum. I'm going to focus on the Labour Party. I mean, the Lib Dems in Scotland, like in the rest of Britain, were pretty much wiped out. I think the key thing that took place at the election was the swing uh, from Labour to the SNP. So in terms of the actual popular vote, uh, the SNP won 50% of the vote. Um, Labour won 24%. So in 2010, the SNP had won 20% and Labour had won 42%, so it is a massive shift. Uh, the SNP have gained 30% of the popular vote, um, and Labour have lost 18%, so this is a big, a big change. And it's important as well to look at the kind of figures that lost their seats. I mean, Jim Murphy, who I'll refer to a, a little bit later on, um, who was the leader um, of the Scottish Labour Party at this time, he lost his seat. Um, in addition, we had figures uh, like the... Um, like the, the shadow Scotland minister, uh, Doug Alexander, who also lost his seat. And he, Danny Alexander, sorry, I always get that mixed up. Danny Alexander, who lost his seat to, uh, it's quite interesting because he lost his seat to Mary Black, um, who's now the youngest, uh, uh, sorry, Jim Murphy lost his seat to, Mar to Mary Black, who's the youngest um, MP in uh for, for literally centuries and she's obviously become a particularly kind of big name on the left of the SNP since then with her kind of inaugural speech that was referencing Tony Benn um, and was really kind of taking like a hold of the sort of old Labour ideas talking about the fact that um, I don't think I've left the Labour Party I think the Labour Party have left me and I think that is really quite representative of the feeling that exists in Scotland they feel like we still hold the values that Labour were supposed to represent but they've kind of moved away from them and we've been left behind. Um, and if we look at the kind of labour heartlands um, that existed in Scotland, like right across the central belt really um, was kind of labour heartlands. The biggest swing um, was in Glasgow North East, which was 39% swing uh, from Labour to the SNP. And if we look in general um, at these constituencies, most of them had at least a 20% swing. There was quite a few that were considerably uh, higher than that. Um, another figure that uh, lost his seat as well was Tom Clark lost his seat um, in Cote Bridge, which is a kind of small, uh, formerly industrial town, uh, not that far outside of Glasgow. Um, and he lost that seat after holding it for 33 years. Um, Glasgow now has no Labour MPs um, at all. They're all SNP MPs. And this is the first time since 1906 um, that Glasgow hasn't had any uh, Labour representation um, at Westminster. So it's really, it really is like a kind of massive change that's taken place. And it, it, it kind of feeds in a lot to what we talk about as well. Like I said, we talk about dialectics um, as, as Marxists. Um, and, you know, a lot of people will say, oh, but they talk about how change, you know, really, is that really going to happen? And people say, you know, things kind of tend to stay the same. But if we look at the situation in Scotland, we've seen a massive change um, that's really taken place over quite a short period of time. Um, Post-election, when Chuka Amuna was still going to stand as, the, as a candidate for Labour leadership, he was talking about you know, how, why have Labour lost seats and why have we failed to win the election after five years of a uh, Tory-led um, government. And he obviously said that you know, we, we paved too far to the left. Um, which is complete nonsense, uh, but we can talk about that a bit more later on. Um, and he also said that in Scotland, he talked about a national politics of Scotland, as though this was just some kind of quirk um, of a long-held nationalism that existed in Scotland. And this is um, just, it, it's completely ahistorical. Um, I mean, if we look at um, the kind of, the, the nationalism um, in Scotland, it is in fact really quite a kind of recent phenomenon um, that is taking place. Um, really, um, for example, Lenin said uh, in one of his writings, he was talking about the national question. He said, you know, it's a very volatile question. Um, it's something that can come up again, even 
um, in countries where it's seen to be solved, such as in Scotland. Um, so in that period, in the early 20th century, it was seen that like, this, the, the national question in Scotland had effectively been solved. Um, and another interesting fact is that, uh, so I said the SNP won 50% of the vote uh, in the election just gone. And the first time, this is the first time that that has happened since the 1950s, where the Tories used to win 50% um, of the vote in, in Scotland. And it's really 1974 where we kind of see the SNP coming into the political picture. And this relates to a very specific thing that was things that were happening at the time. And we obviously had the onset of economic re recession, we had the kind of oil crisis. We also had the discovery of North Sea oil. Um, and a big kind of uh, slogan that this, the SNP used was, it's Scotland's oil. Um, and that was uh, quite a kind of a big thing that they rallied uh, people around. So we sort of see them coming into the picture in 1974. And then you kind of see it dipping. Um, and really, like from about 1992 to 2010, in general elections, we see SNP kind of fairly uh, steadily on about 20% of the vote. I think it's important that we talk about this period um, in the 1990s. I think it's a key period in terms of talking about the Scottish national question um, and, and how that was, has been shaped. Because um, I think the period of Thatcherism is quite key in this. Because, I mean, it, it was something that was debated quite hotly during the referendum. But I think it's quite easy to say that Scotland is not an oppressed nation or an oppressed nationality in the way that a country, for example, like Ireland, that's, placed, that's obviously faced colonial oppression over centuries is. So Scotland's not an oppressed nation um, in that way. And indeed, Scotland was hugely involved in like, going along with the British Empire and taking part in colonialism in that way. But what we see in the 1990s is a kind of shift in terms of how Scotland is framed um, because of Thatcher and because of the fact that she was so unpopular um, in Scotland, obviously continued to be Prime Minister. Um, and things like, in particular, an important factor is the fact that the poll tax, which was obviously the, the, one of the most hated policies um, of Thatcher, was first kind of tried out um, in Scotland as a practice run, um, basically. And I think it's things like that that have sort of reframed um, how Scotland sees itself and like, kind of Scottish nationalism in that way. But really, the important point um, is kind of from uh, 2007 onwards, we see like a kind of big rise um, in the SNP vote, particularly at Holyrood level. Um, it's in 2007 where they first have the largest, they don't have a majority. In fact, I think at the election, they only elected one more MSP than Labour. Um, but they have the biggest number of MSPs and they set up this minority government um, for the first time in, in 2007. And looking at this kind of 2007 uh, victory is quite interesting because a lot of people will say, well, like Chukamuna, is the growth of SNP and support for independence part of a kind of growth of nationalism uh, and a nationalist uh, Scottish identity? But I think it's important to argue against this in any kind of simplistic uh, way. I mean, I think I've already spoken about the kind of impact that Thatcher had on Scotland. And I think in tandem with that, obviously, during the Thatcher period, we saw a huge deindustrialisation um, of Scotland that affected the labour heartlands that I talked about um, in a very big way. We saw the kind of destruction of the steel industry, what was left of the mining industry, uh, the shipbuilding industries, and all these kind of big industries that had provided relatively stable, relatively uh, well-paid jobs were kind of taken away. And we see primarily the production of service sector, uh, unskilled and low-paid uh, jobs and that's a, a big factor as well. Um, but if we look at um, what happened in terms of like 2007, um, so it's important to look at both the role of Labour and the kind of rise of the SNP and see these two things as a dialectic that's kind of working together. Um, so prior to winning the most seats at 2007, so they won the most seats at 2007 Hollywood election, um, the SNP actually took a dip. <coughs> Um, in, its, in the amount of votes it was getting um, at the election prior to that uh, in 2003. Um, and I think this is key because uh, the SNP at the time in 2003 were being led by a guy called John Swinney. Um, and he had taken the SNP down a kind of rightward shift, um, kind of towards New Labour, maybe even a little bit uh, further to the right of that. And it's after him that we see uh, Salmond coming in. And really, this is a key point in terms of how uh, the electoral politics and the electoral plane shifted, because Salmond really moved the SNP to the left. And this is where we could, should see the kind of context 
of their first election in 2007. It was kind of fees, it was um, policies such as abolishing university fees for Scottish students, um, abolishing prescription fees, limiting class sizes. This was the kind of policy that they were first elected on in 2007 and really we've seen them kind of continue on with ever since. And if we look at the 2007 victory as well, at this point, Labour had presided over two terms in office. Um, they'd been in coalition with the Lib Dems because there's a PR system that uh, works in Holyrood, so it means you're unlikely to get a majority. So they've been in, in coalition with the Lib Dems. Um, and, and there was a, really, a, this kind of period, it was kind of a very lacklustre There'd been a lot of leadership crises within uh, the Labour Party. They'd had several different leaders for various reasons, including like a kind of crisis involving fraud. Um, the government very much kind of played a sort of new Labour role, kind of much um, of the same. And then we kind of, in 2007, obviously, the, with the SNP, then pitching itself to the left. And this is where we uh, first see them getting elected. And in 2011, where is the kind of, which is the next Hollywood election that took place? Uh, whereas the SNP kind of continued to push policy for change, continued to be talking about um, abolishing Trident, continued to be talking about social democracy, a Scotland for everybody, all this kind of thing. Uh, the Labour Party at the time had a leader called, the Scottish Labour Party had a leader called Ian Gray, um, and he was kind of grey by name and grey by nature. Uh, he was a very, he was, he was a pretty unbelievably boring uh, individual with one factor but his policy was very reflective of that as well so coming into 2011 where at 2007 labor had been defeated by an smp to the left uh, innovative as they are they came out with their lead policy being carry a knife go to jail and that was a policy that they really campaigned on and was like kind of seen as their, their lead policy and i spoke earlier on about the uh, the Scottish MP, Labour MPs in Glasgow being kind of chased around. Well, this has some precedent. Um, in, in 2011, when Ian Gray was campaigning in Glasgow, he ended up having to tend of, uh, pull himself in in a subway uh, sandwich shop because he'd been being chased around uh, the streets of Glasgow. So there is some precedent for this. So we can kind of see that the sort of cogs were already in motion in this sense. Labour had been placing themselves to the right, the SNP had been placing themselves to the left, They've been using rhetoric um, around change. And I think that's really, at the referendum, we just saw these two things uh, becoming further exacerbated, particularly with Labour going into the Better Together campaign, obviously. And also, like, particularly with what has happened since 2008, with the austerity that's taken place and with the kind of class struggle and frustration um, that that has unleashed. Um, but looking at the period in between the general election and the referendum, um, first of all, um, kind of in the period immediately after uh, the referendum, SNP membership uh, grew to 100,000 members. This is in a country of, of 5 million people, so this is really um, an incredibly uh, large party within that uh, context. And at this point, Labour were very unpopular, and they were seen to be part of establishment, again relating to the role they played in the referendum. And there was a poll in October, it, it would have been pretty much exactly this time last year, it was a poll at the end of October. Um, and it was looking forward to the general election that took place in May of this year. And it, it turned out to be surprisingly accurate. Um, it put the SNP on 52% of the vote, and it put Labour on 23% of the vote. So that's pretty close to what it ended up being, which was 50% and 24%. But it did incorrectly uh, predict that Labour would win four seats and the Nationalists would win 50, obviously, in, in the end. That was the, the figures weren't quite so good for Labour um, on that one. But, I mean, this is quite incredible, because, I mean, at the time, I remember when the poll came out and I saw it and I was like, nah, it won't be that bad, surely not. Like, surely it can't be as extreme um, as that. We've, and even, like, up until quite close to the election, like, despite the fact that there'd been Ashcroft polls and things like this that suggested that... Yes, the SM that had said there was going to be this wipeout. There was still a lot of kind of scepticism within, like the kind of Scot uh, Scottish political establishment that was sort of saying, "Oh yeah, the SNP are going to win by a landslide, but it, it's not going to be 50 seats. It can't be 50 seats. There's all this stuff. Oh, it might be 30. It might be 40. But obviously, we can see in the end it ended up being 56 seats. And if we look at what kind of happened in relation to SNP and Labour in the time in between the referendum and the election, it's quite important as well. So Nicola Sturgeon took over um, as the leader of the SNP 
And if anything, she's probably proved slightly more popular than Alex Salmond already was. Salmond was something of a, a divisive figure. He was seen as a bit of a bulldog, whereas kind of Sturgeon is maybe played a bit more nicely, um, we could say. And obviously it relates to the policy, which we'll talk about um, later on. But, I mean, it, it, there was incredible spectacles, really, that were taking place at this time. Like when uh, Nicola Sturgeon was elected as leader unopposed, and there was like this kind of inauguration ceremony that took place um, in Glasgow, this massive arena in Glasgow that holds about 10,000 people. And there was all these like kind of foam fingers with like SMP and Nicola. And you see her coming on stage and they're all chanting. It really was kind of more like a rock concert than like a kind of uh, political party. Um, in comparison, uh, Labour elected in the December of uh, 2014. Uh, arch playwright uh, Jim Murphy, um, who really was like to the right of the party. Um, he was famous for his support for the Iraq war. And it kind of started out as a, in a, in a, as a young age because before Murphy was elected as an MP, he was head of the NUS. And actually, whilst he was a student, he supported um, the introduction of tuition fees. So this is just how right wing and new labour and individual we are uh, talking about. Um, and Murphy kind of spoke big, and there's quite a lot of funny stuff on the internet now, about how they were going to take on the nationalists and they weren't going to lose a, a single seat. And obviously it looks a bit stupid now. Um, but his attempts were, to say the least, quite, quite pathetic, really. I mean, again, it was a kind of misunderstanding of the situation. Like, instead of trying to kind of tackle the SNP from the left, primarily uh, they tried to kind of take on... The, the nationalist rhetoric, for example, one of Murphy's first, thing, first things to do, which he referred to as his Clause 4 moment, um, was introducing a patriotic clause into the, into, the Scot into the constitution of the Scottish Labour Party, which committed the party to, to, to patriotism. And I think this is how they thought they were going to tackle the SNP. Needless to say, it didn't work very well. Meanwhile, um, if we look at the kind of SNP campaign, uh, interestingly enough, actually, the SNP didn't really talk about independence very much at all in their general election campaign. Really, it was other political commentators that were coming in and saying, are you going to have a second referendum? Are you going to break up Britain? Um, using all these kind of emotive language. In reality, Sturgeon's emphasis was really on anti-austerity. That was their primary uh, policy going into the election, that they weren't going to implement austerity. Uh, social democracy and things like they, you know, they use these kind of phrases like we're going to stand up for Scotland um, and that kind of typical thing. And she proved incredibly popular in debates. I mean, obviously in Scotland, the SNP were riding high anyway. Um, but even uh, south of the border in England, there was apparently a top Google search, um, which was um, how, ca how can I vote SNP um, in England? So a thing like this. Um, meanwhile, Labour at the time were kind of promising really only softer austerity. There was a lot of talk about, um, you know, we need to be responsible. That was really kind of the primary <laughs> message that was coming from Miliband and, and Murphy. And, you know, there were, there were some kind of policies that they came out with which sounded quite ra radical, such as like non-DOM taxation and this kind of thing. But it would be like one week this would come out and the next week it would be back to talking about well, but we need to tackle the deficit and again talking about like the, the, this kind of responsibility rhetoric again. And really I think one of the key moments and something that really shows up um, Ed Miliband for what he was, was that he uh, ruled out the possibility of a coalition with the SNP. In fact, he went so far as to say that he would rather have a Tory government than have the SNP going into coalition with Labour. And I think this was supposed to appeal to English voters, but it didn't seem to work very well anyway. Um, and it certainly didn't work very well for them uh, north of the border. Um, and, you know, there was a typical kind of fear-mongering in the establishment around the SNP, like, oh, if they get into coalition, it's going to lead to Scottish independence, all the, this kind of thing. But I think if we look, therefore, at what has happened, and we talked about, obviously, what's happened at the referendum, what's happened at the kind of last few elections that have taken place in Scotland, and also, probably most importantly, what's happened at this election, I think what we've seen in Scotland, which is obviously primarily the rise of the SNP and the near wipeout uh, of Labour, is really representative of a shift to the left. It's not necessarily representative of a huge kind of typical... Uh, nationalism about you know Scotland the brave and Scotland uh, you know being being the best country. It's more about um, a kind of tack to the left, 
It's more about a desire for change. And I think also a huge frustration with what took place in the new Labour project, a huge frustration with Scotland basically being relied upon for votes, um, but having nothing really being offered to them uh, by the party, being offered really nothing in return. And as I'll talk about this later on, uh, not too much later on, don't worry. Um, <laughs> I think this was representative of a kind of frustration that existed across working classes in all different nations. This wasn't something that was like kind of a peculiarity um, to Scotland. This was primarily a frustration that came out of what's happened in the economic crisis. It came out of the austerity and it came out really um, of class struggle. It just happens that it's been expressed in this way. And I think it's been expressed in this way, which is an unusual way, but maybe not so unusual. We've seen it before, but expressed in a kind of nationalist way because that was the avenue that was open and also because of how poor and the left had been. I think that was a primary factor um, as well. It is the case though, and, and I think a lot of people in the Labour Party in Scotland have been keen to point this out, uh, that the SNP are a party of contradiction, like despite the fact that they were obviously playing this anti-austerity image, this social democracy image, this, you know, uh, you know, this we're, you know, we're, we're representative to the people who voted Labour, we're actually carrying out uh, the Labour policies. Uh, they said this, but at the same time, they were carrying out cuts. Like They've carried out cuts um, at the Scottish Parliament level, particularly to colleges, which has really affected working class young people predominantly. And then also like at council level in Dundee, uh, they've, they've presided over school closures, they've presided over pay cuts. For, uh, and in Edinburgh, which I think is an SNP coalition uh, council, they've actually announced uh, huge numbers of job cuts um, as well. So they're calling themselves anti-austerity, but they're actually carrying out cuts themselves, which is obviously a contradiction. Um, and also one of the key things was that at the referendum when they were talking about their vision for an independent Scotland, uh, they were also talking about cutting corporation tax. And in fact, many of their policies that they kind of promoted at the election, such as, such as increasing the minimum wage, getting rid of zero hour contracts, this kind of thing, were quite similar to some Labour policies that, that Miliband had also introduced. But I think the point has to be the emphasis was completely different. Um, whereas like with Labour, the real focus was on responsibility, the real focus was on we are a party of government, we can govern. Um, with the SNP, the focus was on change, it was on reform, it was on tacking to the left, and it was on like a social democratic um, position, and I think that's that is really the, the kind of key. Uh, if we look at what's happened since the election, it, it was quite funny after the election, despite having lost his seat um, and his party having lost uh, over lost forty seats, Murphy did try to stay as the leader um, of, of the Labour Party for a little bit. It didn't it didn't work out for him in the end? And he got he got kind of forced to go after a couple of weeks, but it was quite a lot of amusing toing and froing um, up until that point. Um, so the kind of election that took place in the Scottish Labour Party was between Keziah Dugdale, who, was, who had been uh, Jim Murphy's uh, deputy, and Ken McIntosh, I think was in the shadow cabinet. Um, and really they were, they were incredibly similar. They were both right-wingers, both kind of from a new Labour background. In fact, Ken McIntosh actually said, I don't have any difference on policy with Keziah. We have exactly the same policy, but I'm more experienced than she is, so you should let me didn't work, she won. But um, anyway, it was, it, was quite, it was quite a spectacle. And really, it, it was very similar to what was taking place at UK level in terms of the Labour leadership election until Corbyn entered the fray, where you had like these, all these kind of uh, candidates that were really putting forward much the same. It was, it, that really was what took place um, in, in Scotland. And I think it has to be said, obviously, um, Scotland flies in the face of all the comments that Labour lost because they were too to the left. That's clear, you know, the party that won all the seats was tacking to the left of Labour. And obviously Jeremy Corbyn is another huge example. I mean, Corbyn ends up winning the election with 60% of the vote, but the reason that Labour lost was because they were too left. Um, and these are two big factors that obviously uh, fly in the face of that. And I think it is important to comment on uh, Jeremy Corbyn and um, being elected. So obviously this is another massive um, political event. And I think really the two are very much connected. They're both born out of the same frustration and anger. And in some ways they're both kind of accidents that are the product of necessity. 
um, as well, which is something we quite regularly talk about as Marxists. For example, like I said, I think this frustration ended up being uh, in Scotland, ended up going down the avenue of uh, the yes vote and independence referendum because that was all, what was there. And if we look at Corbyn, um, Corbyn very nearly wasn't on the ballot paper you know, up until like a, literally a couple of minutes before uh, the, before it was closed, he wasn't on the ballot paper, and then he ended up being a huge expression of really the same frustration that exists in uh, Scotland and in the rest of Britain, and indeed um, across the world as well. But I think in terms of looking at what does this mean for Scotland, there is a very big chasm um, between Jeremy Corbyn and Kazaya Dukdale. She comes from the New Labour school. She's maybe a New Labour person that's willing to talk to the unions. But really, she's very much to kind of on the right of the party, whereas obviously Corbyn is on the far left um, of the Labour Party. So there's this big chasm between them. In fact, Dugdale was one of the many uh, kind of Labour uh, parliamentaries that came out and said, you know, Corbyn can't win, this is going to be a disaster, blah, 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 blah. Um, so that's obviously quite an important point. I mean, there were big meetings for Corbyn um, in Scotland, particularly in Glasgow. There was a meeting, I think it was around somewhere between 700 and uh, 1,000 people. And I think it was noted with big uh, kind of interest. But I think it's kind of, it is slightly sort of different, I think, to what is kind of taking place uh, elsewhere. I think the factor um, of people have kind of already swung um, behind the SNP in a big way, and that's obviously already taken place. Um, and like I say, I think these frustrations are of much the same, but they've obviously kind of expressed themselves in different ways and at slightly uh, different times um, as well. I think the other maybe quite important factor um, is like the fact that the Labour Party, the Parliamentary Labour Party, is obviously still quite divided. Um, it's still got a huge number of like kind of right-wing uh, New Labour um, MPs, and uh, this is something that the SNP, who are a very clever um, political party and have already kind of come out and said, you know, if a, if a Corbyn government was elected, we'd want to work with him, you know, we support all much the same kind of reforms as Corbyn. But the fact is that uh, the divisions of the Labour Party are also something that the SNP can play on and already have. For example, the SNP have criticised what kind of took place with the Trident vote um, at, the, at the Labour conference because the SNP already have an anti-Trident position. Um, and also the, the important factor of like the vote on the budget that took place in the summer, um, whereas all the SNP uh, MPs voted against, it was only quite a small fraction um, of Labour. So they are obviously going to kind of play on these um, and use these. But there is an important point to be made as well that there's been a succession of kind of mini crises for the SNP too. Um, for example, privatisation of Calmax, being, which is the ferry service in Scotland, the proposed privatisation of that. Uh, selling off of uh, Scottish water has been another quite big issue. Um, they, it was found that they were giving money to, to the Tea in the Park Festival, despite the fact that it's already hugely profitable. Um, the SNP were giving them even more money to help them fund moving um, the festival. And there was also like the mortgage fraud that existed around one of their MPs, which was Michelle, Michelle Thompson. And really, this is, just, this is showing like, the nature of them. They are a cross-class party. They're not a workers' party. They've got different elements that exist uh, within the party, and fundamentally, they're a contradictory party, and we've already discussed that um, earlier on. However, I think at the present time, uh, the SNP have obviously got the good excuse that they use quite regularly as well, that, oh, well, it's not us that's making this decision, it's Westminster, and they use that in relation to their cuts. Obviously, we would say that they should defy the budget, but that's the kind of rhetoric that they are using, is that it's, it's Westminster's fault. Or in relation to the water, they said that was the EU's fault. Um, and this is quite a kind of useful excuse for them. And obviously, as well, there had developed such an anger um, at the Labour Party, and this had already gone down this avenue um, towards the SNP and towards uh, the Yes position. So at the moment, it looks like the SNP are still likely to gain further. Um, there's a 2016 Hollywood election that's taking place in a few months' time. Um, in the polls, Labour haven't gained since the election of Dugdale and Corbyn. They're still sitting on around 21%, um, and the SNP are sitting on around 51%. Although it's interesting that with under 35s, the SNP are on about 68%. So it shows that that kind of chasm between younger and older people is still very much at play. Um, the question of independence obviously is hanging in the air as well. 
And it's increasingly so because, I mean, if you look at the electoral result, obviously we have a majority Tory government um, at Westminster, and that's obviously ruling over Scotland. But this is despite the fact that Scotland's only elected one uh, Tory MP, and Scot there is going to be austerity. Um, and this is despite the fact that Scotland's elected uh, this anti-austerity party um, en masse. So it does hang in air, and I think that's maybe particularly in relation to the EU referendum that could be um, a point that could spark it if, in the eventuality, that there was a, v a vote to exit and Scotland hadn't voted to exit. But there's also been, I think with the SNP, it's a difference, it's a chasm that exists between the leadership and the membership, um, which is that the membership obviously want to plough ahead and they really want a second independence referendum, but the leadership won't call a referendum, I think, until they really think they're definitely going to win it. And I think that, that's, a, that's a factor that's hanging there because at the moment the polls are around about 50-50. It kind of dips and troughs between who's in front, but they're around about 50-50 for independence. Um, but there's been a leak, I don't know if it's true or not, that the SNP have said that they will only call a second independence referendum in the eventuality that over a 12-month period there's consistently polls putting independence on 60%. Um, which is a very high benchmark, but obviously we say like dialectics in play. It depends on the concrete situation, depends a lot on what takes place, not just in Scotland, but also in Britain and in the international situation. But I think moving on, you'll be pleased to hear to the end um, of the of the Lido. Um, we obviously have to say that the tumultuous shift that's taken place in Scotland isn't um, is certainly not in isolation. I mean, obviously, um, as we've already said, I would say the Corbyn phenomenon and the SNP and the Yes phenomenon are really coming from one of the same kind of frustrations. They've just expressed themselves um, in different ways and at kind of different times, slightly different times. Um, and obviously, if we look more widely um, in Europe as well, you know, we see the huge kind of movement that existed around Syriza in Greece, Podemos. Um, in Spain, and generally speaking, and obviously even in America, we see the kind of Bernie Sanders and Black Lives Matters um, campaigns as well. And I think in general, we can see in society uh, there is a change brewing um, in the air, and we see more and more. And the phrase is kind of becoming outdated because we're having to use it so much. But political earthquakes um, that are really taking place um, across uh, the world because of the concrete conditions, because. Um, of the capitalism of crisis and because of the resulting uh, class struggle. I think in relation to Scotland, it's an important note, and it's a note that I'll end on, that we need to emphasise that the demands for change in the referendum, that for them to be met, we need to move beyond the SNP, we need to move beyond simply talking about independence, um, and we need to move beyond uh, social democracy. I mean, we've already seen what's taken place in Europe. I mean, Francois Hollande's an obvious example. He got elected on a campaign of, oh, we're going to cut, we're going to uh, increase taxes um, on, on the rich. We're going to introduce reforms. He gets elected, um, and he basically gets told by his own ruling class, <laughs> nah, that ain't going to happen. Um, if we look at a more extreme example, obviously we see what happened with Greece. I don't think Syriza would call themselves a social democratic party, but maybe a left reformist party that was elected on a very radical programme, that was elected on a, you know, we're going to defy all austerity. You know, they even went so far as to have this referendum um, in the summer where they were given the backing of the people. Uh, but we see what happens um, in capitalism. And the fact is that as long as they were unwilling to break uh, with capitalism, they were going to have to implement austerity. And I think it's an important point to make. Um, some groups have said that, some people have said that, you know, austerity is ideological. And they're right to a certain extent, but they're wrong in some ways as well, because they talk about it as though it's something that like the Tories and other parties kind of just do because they're nasty and they like inflicting pain on the poor. But I would say, no, this is fundamentally a capitalist crisis, and this isn't just a cyclical crisis. This is more than that. This is an organic crisis of capitalism that has been brewing for literally decades. And the fact is that they're in, the governments are in massive debts. The economies aren't... Uh, recovering, and that means as long as you're ideologically committed to capitalism, um, will, you will uh, carry out austerity, um, and that's what we've seen uh, that's taken place in Greece. And that's why I would say that our demands need to centre around that fundamental change. We need to be talking about the fact that you can't control what you don't own, 
um, and we need to be talking about really a fundamental uh, socialist change um, in society. <laughs> and fundamentally, we need to be talking about a revolutionary change. Um, we need to be talking about the masses uh, taking the economy, taking the commanding heights of the economy into their own hands and running them from the good of the society. The money is there, the wealth is there, um, the fact is that it's just concentrated in very few small hands. So really, I would say, we need to take these demands that have been expressed themselves in relation to the referendum, and we need to be putting them um, onto a higher plane and link this in. I mean, we would say we don't believe in socialism in one country. We believe about talking about a socialist Scotland as part of a socialist Britain and as part of a socialist United States of Europe.